So we are here to show Mantis, our client, uh, Scala client, Ethereum Classic uh, Scala client. We have been working on it for more than a year, year and a half. And so we are going to show all the cool stuff that we have made. And also I'm going to do a host, a small workshop where I'm going to hack it and to show how can you turn it into a statistical node. So we will be watching cool graphs uh, about the blockchain and, and and the transactions history. First, we're going to go through the, the code and the architecture just to engage people. And then we are going to tweak the, the source code to change the database that we are using, which now is uh, RocksDB. We're going to change it and use uh, a PostgreSDB. So we, then we will be able to run some queries and we are going to use uh, a cool library that is going to display these nice charts uh, on screen. So it's going to be fun. So for example, we will be, uh, we will be showing some queries like uh, which is the top miner at a certain point of time and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for coming. Um, this talk or this workshop is name hacking mantis so hope you like it uh, i i want this to be like a more relaxed session so if you have any questions just raise your hand and interrupt me it's fine um i'm this guy i'm alan i'm a scala developer uh, we work for ahk we are the attics team which means we are a small subset of the growth and team that it's located in in buenos aires argentina you might have noticed my my weird sound, uh, my, my English, let's say. So let's start. So I told you that we are going to hack Mantis. So before hacking Mantis, we need to learn what it is and what the tools we have used to create it, right? And then we will do this hacking session. So what's Mantis? Mantis is a Scala-based Ethereum Classic. It, it has been written from ground up in Scala. And here you can see uh, the release history. So in July 2017, we released our alpha version, which includes transaction execution and block synchronization. Transa transaction execution is basically the, the EVM. Uh, so we wrote it in Scala from scratch again. And uh, in August, we released our beta version, which included the JSON RP RPC API the mining and pruning. Pruning is the mechanism that allows you to remove some state from the state try that you don't need to keep your database small. And in January, we released our first version, the production one, uh, which includes Dedalus integration. Dedalus is a wallet developed by IHK. Uh, so you can interact with, with Mantis using a nice UI and it has some stabilization and the monetary policy ECIP. And the next release, the 2.0, is going to include some performan performance improvements as well as the, the new EIPs, the ones for Byzantium and Constantinople. Uh, the, those pull requests are ready for review, so they should be merged soon. Um, and one thing that I really like is that Mantis is being used for other projects and not just for IHK ones. So we have seen some other people using our code base for their cryptocurrencies or their blockchains. So that's quite nice. Uh, here is the repo. It's public, open source. You can use it, tweak it. And there is the documentation site. So you can get in there and start using it. So functionalities, again, it has regular and fast sync, transaction execution, the JSON RPC API, peer discovery, pruning. So it's full ETC compatible. So you can just launch this client and download the chain and start processing transactions. So you can run your full node or your light node uh, using this client. And it's only 15K lines of code. So it's quite small. Uh, that's because of Scala and I will tell you about that later. And also, it has a lot of tests, so I'm not including within this 15K all the tests that we have. We have unit tests, integration tests, 
And we are also running the Ethereum test suite, which is a centralized repository with common tests that are language agnostic that you can run to check that, for example, your virtual machine runs OK, or it, in general, your node is compatible with other nodes. So that's pretty cool. So why Scala? Do we have any Scala? Sorry, those tests are inside the network? Yep, yeah, yeah. And you can run them against any verifier? Yeah, no, yeah, this, uh, this is a, an, an open, a different repo. Uh, have you ever heard of it, the Ethereum test suite? So th this is the Ethereum test suite, and we are compatible. So right. we have a submodule, and you can run all of the tests. But we can check the repo if you want to. So do we have any Scala developers? Sweet. So uh, I don't want to get into a language wars or anything like that. I love all languages besides C. So um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I, this is just, I, I'm going to speak about Scala and why I like it. It doesn't mean I don't like other languages like Haskell or like Java or JavaScript. So why Scala? Um, first of all, because uh, this is the first client written in Scala, so that's brand new. Um, but also because it's JVM based. JVM is a Java virtual machine. Um, and that virtual machine is battle tested in production. Some people might say it's slow, but it has been running for years in enterprise grade software, and it's really, really good. And it has a lot of libraries. Uh, it doesn't have as much libraries as you might find in Node.js, for example, that when you have a package for uh, turning a string in uppercase, you might find 50 packages to do so. Uh, in, in Java related languages or JVM related languages, you have like two different packages that do the same. Uh, but they are really good, and they are heavily used. So I think that's a strength. And also, you have a lot of tools, like the debugger is awesome, the IDEs. The, I mean, it's been around like for 20 years, so uh, tools are great. It also supports two different paradigms. You can code in object-oriented paradigms. So as we know, uh, domain objects are represented as objects that you can send messages between them, and they hold state. But also, the thing that I like is that you can do some functional programming. And actually, our code base is mostly functional programming uh, style. So before jumping to the functional programming definition, uh, the type system is awesome in Scala. I mean, the compiler is super great. Actually, the, the people that created Scala, they are specialists in creating compilers. So Scala is like. It's super good at, at, at compiling. And actually, you don't need to define some types, and the compiler will look them for you. So it's, it's quite awesome. And we, we feel protected using the types. So. Uh, and functional programming. So have you ever heard about functional programming? No? Raise your hands. Yes. <laughs> so um, we're using functional programming, which is a different kind of modeling software. Uh, it's, it, it, it allows you to model software as functional, uh, as functions like in maths. They don't have state. They, they don't change the state. They are like just pure functions that you can use and compose to create your software. And that's quite cool because, uh, first of all, it's closer to math. So you can, if you, in a small program, I'm not talking about this big project, but you can start thinking about a function application. And you can start replacing values and understand what's going on because it's like doing math at high school. So it's, it's quite awesome. And also, it's less verbose. And that's why we have uh, 15 kind lines of code instead of 50. So uh, and, and it makes the, the code easier to read, right? Uh, so that's why we like functional programming. Besides, Charles, love it. Um, so I'm going to show you some snippets in Scala. Uh, the idea is not to teach you Scala, but, so, but to let you know just a couple of things that we found that are really, really cool. For example, you are seeing here a function that it's called from bytes, which receives a type, which is an integer, a payload, which is an array of bytes, and the protocol version, which is an, another object, right? another type. And it returns a message. So just looking at the types, you can understand what's going on there, right? So that's pretty cool. 
Um, and we have here, I, I will show you two cool stuff that you can do in Scala. The first one is that we have this stuff that it's called pattern matching. It's sort of the, the structuring in JavaScript somehow, but you can match it. It's like the child between the structuring and switch and ifs and all that stuff. So let, let's see the example. So here I'm creating a tuple with the protocol version and the type, right? And here I'm matching this tuple against different values. And cool things that I can do within this match. I can just ignore uh, the first value, for example. I just want to match for this one, because it, in order to parse the hello message, I just need the type. I don't need the protocol version, because it's the same message in all the versions. Or, for example, I can match this type against both the two protocol versions at the same time with this, uh, with this little guy here. And what I can also do is, after matching, I can use this value in a function call. So basically, I'm matching the something, and I'm processing it. And if you wanted to do this in JavaScript, it would be like a bunch of if statements with returns, or a switch statement with another switch statement inside, or something weird. So in Scala, it's just this. And also, one thing that you might not have noticed is that, for example, look at this, this sentence. So we are saying payload dot to hello. But I told you that payload, it's an array of bytes, which is a standard type. It's an array. So how can you do that? When in Scala, you have this thing named implicits. I'm not going to speak about it because they are a little bit confusing. But basically, you can attach methods to existing classes. So I'm, I'm able to attach this to hello, which converts this array of bytes to a message just to the array. So that's pretty cool, I guess. And the code is quite readable. Yes, yes. Actually, it's wrapping it. So you, you can wrap it and extend it. it it's quite cool. Uh, actually, in this example, we are not able to see how am I wrapping it, wrapping it, because but you just need to import something on your file. It looked for the implicit, and then when you looked for this sentence, the compiler knows which wrapper to use, and magic. Like per file, it's wrapped, so it's not like Sorry? Some, li so some library might try to add to hello to an array, but that doesn't mean that my array is Exactly. And this is a really good way to add methods. For example, if you are importing a library uh, and you want to extend it, you just can do this. But implicit can be tricky, so you need to be careful. Um, this is a functional programming concept, so I'm not going to get too deep into this kind of type, but we are going to talk about options. So first, let's see the function signature. So this function is named getBlockTransactionCount by hash. So this is a JSON RPC API method that allows you to return the transaction count for a given block hash, right? And it returns a service response, blah, 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 which is the thing that we are going to return uh, uh, from our uh, server. So let's think about JavaScript. So how can you do this? So you need to look for the block in your database by hash, and the block might or might not be there, right? And if it's not there, what do you need to do in JavaScript? Your DB layer should return null or, I don't know, empty string. I don't know, whatever you want to. That's weird. And then you need to place an if statement saying, if this is null, uh, return 0 or null. Uh, but if it's not null, just let's count the transaction list, right? Size. So that's, that's like a little bit weird. I mean, you have an if statement. You need you, you're, you I mean, the code is not as fancy as this one. So what I'm doing here, we have this type, which is named option. And option, it's like a type that might or might not have a value. So it has two uh, instances. It might be none, which means no value, or it might be some and can hold the value, right? So and that's actually what we are trying to represent with the, with the database. In the database, the block might be there and hold the value, that's sum and the value, or might not be there. So it's none. It's not null. Why null? Yeah. There's this library in JavaScript called funfix that gives you exactly 
Uh, exactly, yes. And uh, this is embed in the language. And, and, and look what we are doing here. So there is no if statement. So you might ask me, OK, what happens if the block is not there, right? So basically, here you will see that we are calling blockchain get, get block body by hash. So we are retrieving the body. And if it's nonce, this if it's uh, none, this map function won't be doing anything. It will just return the value. It won't, it will return the, the null, sorry, the none. It will it won't try to access the value because there is no value. But if this function return a block body, which means a sum block body, we can just take the value, apply this transaction list dot size, which means let's count the, the transactions, and it puts back again into the sum container. So basically this is a nice container that you can take the value, process it, or if it's not there, it won't do anything. No null pointer exceptions, no if statements, nothing. So it's quite nice, right? And then you can represent this uh, none with a null value or whatever you want to for the end users. But within your code, you don't, you don't need to face with those kind of things. And this is a similar example. It's not the same. Uh, I'm, I'm presenting you this either type, which is similar to option. Um, basically, either might have two values, left or right. Um, so let's look at this function definition. So this function is named validate, and it receives a block header and a parent header and returns either a block header error or a block header valid message. So basically, what this function is doing is to is validating the, the block. Right? So first of all, if you want to do this in another language, what, how, how could you do it? I mean, you can throw an exception if it's invalid. So wh why would you throw an exception, right? Um, uh, or you can just create this hierarchy of objects that the, are the, the parent is block validation, and it could be error or not, and then you can switch somehow in your code or check a, a message or something. Uh, in Scala, it's way much easier. And actually, I'm really proud of this piece of code because it's really easy to read. So this is a construction that, in the end, it does something like the map but it's not map, it's flat map, it's, it's similar. Um, and basically, you can see that we are calling different validations. So we have validate extra data, validate timestamp, validate difficulty, and so on and so forth, until we return a block header which is valid. But if we find an error here, for example, here, the timestamp is wrong, the validation or the, the difficulty is wrong, it will return a left, right? Because we have the errors on the left and the valid on the right. So in Scala, we have this map is right biased. So if we return a left, the map will stop, right? So that's pretty cool, because if we want to short circuit the, the execution of this piece of code, if we return a left, it will just end and return the error. So look at this validation. So if we found an error in gaseous we are not going to execute neither this line or this line or this line. We are just going to return the left with the error. So this is quite cool because if, if you wanted to implement this in JavaScript, it would be a bunch of if statements with returns and or not, or maybe no. Yeah, so I mean, I, I don't have anything against JavaScript. Uh, I really like it. But in, in Scala, this piece of code is quite readable, right? Yeah, this, yes, this, this gets translated to a bunch of flat maps uh, chain. This is like sugar syntax. And this is called for comprehension. Uh, it, it's, it's quite good. And you can add filters, uh, like if statements with conditions and stuff. You can do assignments. Um, it's similar to Haskell do notation. So I'm going to speak about a little bit on Mantis architecture, so, because this is required so you can understand the hack that I'm going to do afterwards. So first of all, uh, one of the goals that we had when we were coding Mantis is try to avoid uh, advanced libraries. And you might ask me why. And we try not to make too hard for newcomers to approach the code. 
So we are not using Scala C, Cats, Shapeless, Shapeless, or, any, or any other library. And but don't get me wrong, Cats is a super awesome library, but it it requires you to understand a little bit more about uh, type system and, and Scala and more advanced topics. So if you wanted to introduce a new Haskell, a new uh, developer, it would be more difficult. And actually, Scala C it's a part of Haskell uh, libraries into Scala. So for concurrency, we are using Akka. So Akka, it's like a wow, it's it's an incredible library. So in Mantis, we have a bunch of stuff going on at the same time. We are downloading blocks, headers, bodies. We are receiving messages from the JSON RPC API. Everything is going on at the same time. So you need to a, a way to handle this kind of concurrency, right? And you have several options, in, at least in a uh, Java virtual machine. You can use uh, mutexes and synchronized blocks, which they are fine. And you can spawn threads and do all that stuff, which is fine, but it's more difficult. Or Akka, it's an implementation of the actor model. And the easiest way I can explain to you about this model is I can imagine the actor model as a bunch of little guys that have an inbox. And every time you want them to do something, you just leave them uh, an envelope. And basically, when they receive this message, they process them one by one. And if there is no message, they just sit without doing anything. So your CPU is fine. So every time a message comes, I, they process them. And they can call other stuff. And then they shut down. They don't shut down. They just sit. So uh, that's the way we process everything. So if we are handling messages that are coming, like a, a new transaction. We post that to the transaction, uh, to the actor that receives the transaction. It processes it, it places it in the mempool, and then it sits. And it's quite cool because it allows you to model very complex uh, concurrency-based pro programs in that way, which is really, really easy to understand. Uh, but Akka is much more than that. You can do clusters. You can spawn these actors in different cluster in different machines, and they can coordinate. Actually, you can you have this supervisor mode where you can if an actor dies, you can respawn it and, and stuff. So it's it's really cool, and it's similar to the uh, Erlang actor model. For crypto, we are using Bouncy Castle. So I placed this one because I wanted to show that you can use any JVM library in Scala, and it works out of the box. It just works. Um, for the DB, we were using uh, LevelDB, uh, but we have found that it doesn't work quite well. So we changed it to RocksDB. And I placed this one because RocksDB is running, it's written in C, right? I hate C. But there is a wrapper around C that it's running in Java, and you can call native C functions from that wrapper. So it's quite cool. You can also call native functions. Obviously, this is a uh, this is a little bit tricky because these libraries might have memory leaks. So you should try to avoid them. But if this is the only option, you can do it as well. And while we are using Sears as a JSON parser, which is a Scala library, and we are we are using Scala test for test, and this is this one is really really amazing. So. There is a library in Haskell, which is named QuickCheck. And basically, it's a property-based uh, testing framework. So let's suppose this case. So you want to check that this function receives a natural number uh, and another number, and it adds them, right? So what kind of tests you can do? That there is a property that we might say, which is if you add two uh, natural numbers plus 0, let's suppose, the result should be equal or be greater than the first number, because that's how you use some numbers, right? So this framework allows you to create tests based on properties. And you, let the, the, and you need to tell, them, tell this framework how do you create these this test cases. So you say, OK, I, I want to test all the, the natural numbers. And the way you generate a natural number is like this. And then this framework sta starts running a bunch of tests with different values, looking for corner cases. And believe me, you can find a bunch of, a bunch of er corner cases using this library. So it's quite cool. It's, it's really impressive. Um, 
And this is an architecture diagram. It's simplified. I mean, we have a bunch more stuff around, but I, I want to make a point about this diagram. So uh, first of all, we have the ledger, which is the one that receives the data and process uh, the information. It receives the blocks and process the transactions. It runs the validations, and then it calls the Java virtual machine to uh, the Ethereum virtual machine to run the, the, the transactions. We have on the bottom layer, we have the network, which receives the messages and send them, sends them to the uh, sync package, which is the one that runs these actors and receives the messages and asks for more data and all that stuff. And we have the DB, which is uh, the package where all the data access is being held. We have the domain where all our domain classes are, are, are stored. And we have this JSON RPC, which connects to the ledger to, for example, if you want to estimate gas, we need to execute the transaction. So you can you, then you call to the virtual machine, or you can interact with your key store if you want to unlock your personal account. So why I'm placing this diagram? Because I want you to pay attention to this little guy, because I'm going to hack it. So now you might have a better understanding of what Mantis is. Do you have any doubts about it? It's quite straightforward. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn Mantis into a statistical node. So I'm going to replace the DB package, and I'm going to inject a Postgres database. A Postgres database, instead of being a key value storage, is a relational database. And you can run some cool queries. Uh, and I'm going to use another tool to display some nice charts. So let's get into it. This is the main method of Mantis. Uh, this, this might remind you as the Java static main, whatever. And here we're creating our node, right? And when, when we create our node, basically we are extending in runtime. This is quite cool. You can extend interfaces in runtime, and you can change the behavior in runtime. In run and what I'm going to do is to change, I'm going to change here the, you can see here we, I have a, a, the blockchain. So the blockchain is the thing that accesses the data. It's like the, the interface to work with the data. So let's see blockchain first. So trade is like an interface. It's the, the same concept. So what can we do with a blockchain? We can get a block header by hash, or we can get a, a block body by hash, or we can interact with the state, or we can get the best block number, or we can save information. So we can save the block with the receipts and, and stuff. So we had, we used to have a default implementation, which receives a bunch of storages. These are all uh, level DB or rocks DB storages, key value ones. But what I'm going to do is to replace this one with a Postgres DB one. I'm going to use a library named Quill, but you can use any library you want to. It's fine. So what I'm doing here is instead of receiving a bunch of storages, I'm going to receive a Postgres storage. Uh, I, I'm not storing the state or any other things into this database because I just wanted to do a, a short demo, uh, but you could do it as well. So if you look at the Postgres storage, what we are doing here is to define a bunch of methods that interact with the blockchain. For example, we are saving a block. And while we are saving a block, we are creating a transaction, a DB transaction, and we are saving the block header and the block body. And saving the block header basically is uh, inserting it into the database. And but to do so, we need to transform the block header, which, for example, holds a byte array and something more interesting for us so we can run some queries. And here I'm turning, it, for example, the byte arrays into strings. Um, so what I'm doing here, as you can see, is create a new, sorry, uh, here. So instead of creating this old blockchain implementation, which is the key value one, I'm using a Postgres one. And what I'm trying to do is to insert data. Instead of a key value storage, I'm going to insert it into a Postgres database. And you might ask me, why would you want to do that? 
uh, are you stupid or something? So no, the trick is that what I can do is something like this. So hope this works because Wi-Fi is a little bit, uh, it's not working well for me, but I have data preloaded just in case. So here we have uh, an SQL IDE, so I'm connected to the database. So I'm select, selecting the max number from the block headers table. And you might see that I have the 56 something, right? So what I'm going to do is to start synchroniz synchronizing from the network and inserting data into this database. So with a bunch of like 50 lines of code, I was able to change the database layer. So it's running. It's comp now it's compiling. Compiler is a little bit slow because it does a lot of stuff. So the database started the connection. And now it's trying to connect to different peers. Well, it's looking for peers. So this might not work. Let's see. If not, I will show you some graphs. Don't worry. Well, there are no peers. Let's see. So and you can see here a discovery message. So it's trying to look for peers. Uh, it's trying to do handshake. Well, it's not my Wi-Fi is bad. But, but if you believe me, this works. We can try it later on a Starbucks or anything like that. What you g might get is this. So this tool is named PC Charts. It's like a really cool tool. You can connect this tool to a database, a Postgres database, and you can run some cool queries. So let me show you the one that I like most. The number of logs mined by address, right? So I process the data, and if you look at this query, I'm not a SQL hacker, but you can see I have a query here. And what we can do is to get something like this. Ta -da. So you can see that we are getting this nice uh, pie chart uh, with, based on, a, on different addresses. And you can see the top five miners. Doesn't mean it's the same miner. It's the same address. It's the same beneficiary in the block header. But you can see, for example, this one got 10% of the, of the, of the mine blocks. It's others, others. So this is the sum of all the miners. Other queries that you can run if you trick, hang, if you hack Mantis to the way I did. So for example, you can see the tr top transaction senders. Uh, it's just a, a stupid query and you can run your own and you can create indexes. Even you can insert this data into, a, into tables so you don't need to run on, uh, on the fly queries. But you can see, for example, this account has sent 969 transactions. If I need traces, does it support traces? Traces, transaction traces? No, no, I'm not inserting that information. But you can do that. I mean, it's a, it's a nice challenge, I guess. Just give me a language you want. So for example, this one uh, displays the block difficulty evolution for a certain block. So you can see it's growing. Uh, what else? I have a bunch. Uh, transaction evolution, I don't remember what's this one. So based on a date, you can see the amount of transactions given a month. Uh, what else you can see? Uh, the, the number of omers evolution by month. So more omers were created here, which means more miners probably. So, and this is quite cool. And you can run your own queries. Well, no blocks, so I was expecting that. So. Basically, with 50 lines of code, and actually, there are other projects that have coupled the virtual machine and plugged in a different virtual machine. And they have also changed the, um, the consensus layer. So they are using a different consensus algorithm, for example, Raft. So that's why I think Mantis is a good piece of code. And that's it. Yeah.